So hello everybody, my name is Callie Dolphy. I'm a senior data scientist in Red Hat's open source program office. And we'll be talking today about the OSPO data pyramid. Um, a little bit about me, I'm originally from South Texas and moved up to Boston um, to go to BU and play softball there originally and stayed there for the computer science program. These days I'm usually skiing, especially during the winter and playing a lot of volleyball during the summer, and then that's just me and my wonderful mom. So, what we are going to discuss today. First, we're gonna actually go through the history of community data analysis at Red Hat. It's actually a lot richer history than I even knew before preparing for this session. And then we're gonna go into an overview of what Project Aspen is, and that will go directly into talking about the OSPO data pyramid and what that statement even means. So. This is going to be going through the dense history of community data analysis at Red Hat. And this is all courtesy of my manager, Brian Profit, and being honestly a great historian with all the information that he was able to provide me. So Red Hat's journey to using data and metrics to establish community health started quietly as early as 2012 when Harish Pillay began working on the problem of how to quickly analyze the health of an open source project. The project was not created for OSPO or its predecessor of the open source and standards team. Rather, Harish had developed the project for the legal team who wanted a fast way to quickly see community status to determine if Red Hat could join the project. The project was known as Prospector, a tool for automated collection and continuous tracking of a wide range of metrics of open source projects useful in evaluating the health and trends of projects. Prospector would then assign green, yellow, or red icons to those aspects depending on their status. This straightforward dashboard would be the start of Red Hat's journey into community metrics. Just before Brian Profit's start at Red Hat in late of 2013, Dave ne Neely and Daniel Villard started their own path to community metrics, partnering with Batergia, who would eventually host community and project-oriented metrics via a dashboard on the old communityredhat.com site. This was a project that Brian Profit took over in 2014 for two big reasons. One, he heard a talk by Don Foster, the then director of Community Labs at Linux Summit in San Francisco. Don highlighted the benefits of a much deeper data analysis communities, and Brian was convinced that this would solve the problem that had long bothered him about the state of community management. Community managers, it seemed, would always play to their strengths. A developer would focus on engineering best practices, a marketer would pay more attention to community and people aspects. Neither approach or any in between would be wrong, but it could lead to problems getting mixed in their early stages data decision-making potentially could level the playing field. The second reason was that Prospector was rediscovered by Brian, but the project lay dormant until March of 2017, when he made a pitch to management to open the code back up to GitHub in the hopes that we could get some interest from engineers inside and outside of Red Hat to start working on it again. Coincidentally, this was the same time that chaos was starting up, and the decision was made not to re restart Prospector on its own, but rather donate it to the brand new Project Chaos. In August of 2017, Brian joined, joined Project Chaos, and in September, Chaos was announced with the donations of Prospector from Red Hat, Craig it from Daniel, um, Daniel German, Professor of Computer Science at the University of Victoria, and Grimoire Lab from Baturgia. Soon after the initial launch, Augur, a database platform from the University of Missouri, would also be added to the mix. Augur enables users to focus on data from GitHub and GitLab platforms, which can scale to tens of thousands of repositories, which years later would be used as a data source for Project Aspen. In 2018, Brian joined the Chaos Board within OSAS, which is now OSPO. Metrics became more part of the decision in the passing months. By early 2020, though, it became clear that the current um, set of tools and strategies were no longer gonna be applicable for everything that Red Hat wanted to do. Beyond the day-to-day -day monitoring of open source community health, it became very apparent to customers, partners, and Red Hat Associated that they wanted to know more about the health of the community to determine whether they should join a community, and if so, what issues they might face. Sustainability was now a big part of what we needed. And this is where I come into this. In 2020, I became an intern at Red Hat 
And in that first about year, it was really a bunch of one-off requests. In that time period, I was trying to learn everything that I could learn about community. I remember doing the intern with Brian, or doing the interview with Brian, and thinking that because I had a GitHub account and had a repository, that I was a open source contributor. And so I had a lot to learn, but I was able to bring in the knowledge of data science and how it's used in academia and how it was used in different industries and taking the knowledge of those one-off requests, things that I could learn from OSPO and the context that I had learned from academia, that's where it came into creating, at that time, Project San Diego. And that time we really hit the same questions and needs behind why legal created Prospector in the first place in 2012. And this kind of whole full circle moment was there. Um, this year, there was a bit of an experimental phase that was the 2020 May to mid 2021 that would then lead to Project San Diego and then would eventually be released into the world as Project Aspen. So now we're up to current date. And so going more deeper into the inspiration behind Project Aspen and 8Knot, um, whenever I was doing a lot of these one-off requests and back in 2020, um, I spent a lot of time looking at the tooling available and where it fit our needs and where the limitations were from the analysis we wanted to do. Um, the biggest problem that we were hitting was not being able to directly access the data to do the pre-processing in Python or in our environment. And that is really where a lot of the research in, for the last 20 plus years of data science has been done. And we wanted to do some more complex analysis to be able to build off of that. So creating, we wanted to create a project with that 20 years of experience from academia and the corporate world to the center and take inspiration from the work that had been done in other spaces and analyzing and use that as a framework and use a data science workflow in mind. And the direct access to structured data allowed us to capitalize on the Python packages and be able to do some more complex data pre-processing that would really feed into our visualizations. So, what is Project Aspen? There is two main parts to this project. The first one is coined 8Knot, which is a community data analysis dashboard application. Um, it uses a cloud-native container deployment strategy. It uses Augur from the Chaos Project as a data source, and it is a Python-native data science tool, came, tool chain, mainly using Dash, Plotly, and Pandas um, as to, like, use the app. And then for the second portion of it is Repel. And this is our open research. And a lot of times that's where more of our complex visualizations start when we need to develop and learn more before integrating it into a fully interactive visualization. A good example of this is some heat map graphs that if we have some time, I'll show at the end. It took a lot of time, iteration, and research to understand how to tie contributor activity to code-based knowledge retention. That's just something that you can't do in a first round pass on an application. The current focus right now is looking at the developer network graph analysis of open source communities. And what that looks like right now is to look at the contributors in different communities and see how they move between one another. How are these projects connected and what can that tell us about the future of techno different technology spaces? So how does 8Knot work? So we have this, it's gonna be visualizing open source community data. It will give, we'll put in repo and org URLs and we'll give those into Augur, which is a relational database with organized GitHub data and enforced relationship structure. And that structured data really is what powers some of our more complex visualizations. We don't have to do that pre-processing. We can be sure that when we have a contributor ID, we can link together their comments on an issue and their pull request and then a review. And that's something that we don't have to do on our side. And so we take the data from that Augur database and that feeds directly into the 8Knot dashboard, which again is a dash plot lead dashboard. Um, and with the structure, it visualizes any results that we have from Augur data. So now how does this work with what Red Hat is doing internally? We take the results from the overall arching Aspen project, 8Knot Repel, and it fuels into our internal net analysis and decision making. 
I'll talk about this a little bit more later, but as I was running through these slides this morning, I figured, I kind of thought about it, and it's a lot more of a roundabout than it is a one-way street. As I work through requests and questions within Red Hat, it feeds back to 8 knot especially. And I'll be showing some case examples of this later in the talk. It's been incredibly exciting to see how decision making around communities has evolved, especially in the last three to eight months, or six to eight months, as our data analysis portfolio has matured and evolved. One of the most surprising takeaways from this is how much time has been saved from the ability to confirm assumptions and claims about communities that we're involved in and spend a lot more time determining what actions should be made. So the title of this is the data pyramid, so it's time to start looking at some pyramids. So whenever I was a kid, I remember seeing the food pyramid and cafeterias and talked about in classes. The idea is our bodies needs a lot of different types of nutrients to stay healthy, which means eating a lot of variety of foods from the main food groups. The food pyramid is an analogy that displays the ratios between different food groups to have a healthy, balanced diet. In the most basic form, the food at the bottom is what we should eat more of, the ones towards the top a little bit less from, but that might be the ones that draw our attentions the most. In the short term, Having this balanced diet can make us feel good, energized in our day-to-day -day life. Long-term, it can reduce our risk for different diseases. And this concept can apply directly about how we think and prioritize our community data analysis. And so this is where we go into the OSPO data pyramid. And this is an event that I'm introducing this concept. We're we'll gonna be working on it. I hope this is the beginning of this conversation and not the end. And so now, instead of thinking about the foods that we eat, but let's think about who, as an OSPO, directly interacts with when we're, with the data analysis that we do. The base of community data analysis are our open source communities. This can be how we interact and assist the communities that we're already involved in, or help determine which communities we get involved in in the first place. As OSPOs, let's be honest, hold it to the companies that we work for. It can be easy to look first internally, especially towards the C-suite and the products that determine the trajectory of our companies. But if our focus is there, we're doing ourselves and our companies a disservice because that is not a long-term balanced diet for an OSPO. We have to fool ourselves with healthy communities to be able to sustain open source efforts that benefit our companies in the long term. Now, let's start to break down each portion of this pyramid. So, we first have our base level, which is our open source communities. And so we wanna focus on our strategic invo involvement and make informed initiatives. This can look like a couple of different things. This can first start looking at community health analysis. This can be as an OSPO to help understand the community better, or it can be to help the community itself understand itself and then be able to apply proactive and informed initiatives. If you have the ability to measure and look at different data points, it's a lot easier to understand the impacts of different initiatives that you've made, see that and see if you need to be able to tweak what you've been doing or if it's having any, uh, in the impact you expected. Last portion of this is looking at comparative analysis within communities when it is applicable. And I'll be showing a couple of different visualizations here that I like to think about in the general case. This is gonna get really interesting because I have to find my cursor on the screen. So here is 8 knot. And we're gonna be looking at some of the visualizations that I would do in the general case of looking at open source communities. This is very specifically the start, the context of whatever questions that you have about that specific community, the context of what you are looking, like what is the specific thing that you want to know about it is going to inform what you look at beyond this point. But I would start looking at kind of just the general repository information and start looking at what files are involved, how is the package updates, um, looking at this, um, the OSSF scorecard, some people really find that to be important, and then looking at the general, or the general repository information. Also, I should have said for context right now, 
this is eight knot and the overall search bar is the organization i can't see exactly which one before i'm pretty sure that it's three scale and then um, whenever we look down below, these are one of the visualizations that does it by specific repositories in the set that you have in the search bar. So we'd be able to click this one and see, we can see what they have available. A lot of times if you're not looking at the specific like main repository in an organization, this type of per repo analysis is not going to provide any really rich information. But beyond that, we can start kind of looking around at some of the other visualizations that I like to start with. And one of the big ones I like to do is looking at this contributor growth by engagement. Um, as this is loading, we'll kind of see it. It breaks down the overall contributor activity by active, drifting, and stale. And that's something that as a user for 8Knot, you would go and select yourselves. And it's always going to be this up and to the right motion. You're not going to get less total contributors over time. And what I really like to look at is how is the active and drifting contributor base changing over time? And so this is a, the overall st stale people, so the people who have not been involved in over a year by the standard, is kind of skewing the visualization to really be able to get much information from it. So that's when I would choose to kind of put that out of the picture and then start to look at what is this active and drifting contributor base look like? How is it staying consistent over time, or in this case, starting to dip down? And you have to kind of take in the context of this community. This is an older community. It's getting a lot more stable, not a lot of huge developments. And so this kind of would make sense for its current situation. And so I'm going to pop over to a couple of other visualizations. See, one of the ones that I also like to start with is pull request staleness and seeing, okay, what type of like consistency do they have with people opening pull requests and how long are they staying open over a span of time? Um, and then also looking at it from an issue perspective. And sometimes you can have communities that have a very large issue backlog. And a lot of times that can just be because some, nobody went and did any type of clean out. And some of those have been there for years and not really ever going to get touched. And that's another time where I like to be able to use, this is a plotly um, feature where I'm able to say, okay, that's not giving me the full view I'd like to see. I just want to see the stalling and stale. And so we, let's see also some graphs that we can do in comparison. Um, so over here, we're looking at an entire org, so you're not usually going to compare um, repositories within the same org, but this will get a chance to just look at a visualization that would be used for this reason. Um, project Velocity looks at comparing projects on a couple of different axes, and so you can see it in context of the number of contributors that you have, um, number of commits, and then you can determine what actions are the most important to you that you want to compare your communities by. This can be by issues, comments, closed, PRs, anything like that, and then you can start to see those visualizations in comparison to one another. Um, one last visualization that I like to look at a lot is looking at lottery factor over time. Um, this is something that is a lot of times is viewed or called bus factor. So it's how, what is the least number of people that, con that constitute, whether right now we have it at 50%, but 50% of a specific set of actions. And so if we go and kind of look at this graph, we can see I'm sorry, it's a little hard to see on this projector, but you can kind of look at different points in time and see how many people, so in this case, 12 people, constituted 50% of the commits in the time period of October 31st, 2012 to October 30th of 2013. And so you can kind of see what the, how the activities are dependent on how many people over time, is that going down, all that good stuff. So these are just some of the examples of the different visualizations that I'd look at in this first base level option. So the next one. Now we have our mid middle level. And this is what I'd consider cross-organizational collaboration. And the biggest thing I've found here is that we're able to build trust and relationships with other teams within our company. Um, data analysis is a vessel that can be used to build that trust and relationships with those organizations. 
in any company, I know that OSPOs are always trying to fight the good fight to make sure that open source is understood and prioritized. OSPOs being able to back, provide data back claims can level that prioritization playing field, and we can also assist the teams around us. In practice, I've seen analysis to be the reason why certain teams walk through the OSPO door. And I can send them out with analysis and the context necessary for this information to be useful and the connection with an OSPO member that can help them with their efforts going forward. It's really been a very it's like relieving trend, I think I would, I would call it, to see that other teams within Red Hat are starting to come to our OSPO sooner and sooner whenever different community decisions are being made. And how does this one look in Axton? This is a lot of times is me curating an analysis and reports for specific questions and circumstances. And this is an opportunity for us to show and not tell that OSPO is the subject matter experts. We can provide this analysis. We can provide the people who have the correct context to be able to tell them their actions. I'm the starting point. I should not be the ending point. And a lot of these questions that I get from different teams within Red Hat is a starting point for analysis that I wouldn't have considered prior. And so I'm actually gonna pull up some of the reports that I have made in the past for some of the people within Red Hat. And one of these has just been looking at CNCF language analysis. So we wanted to see within the CNCF, what is the breakdown of the different languages used in the files? And if you notice, this is actually we go down to the visualization that has ended up used in this report. We look at the breakdown by files and by um, lines of code. And this visualization actually went straight into 8-knot. If we can actually pull it up right here. And I had honestly never had thought about making this page before or going into this level of detail. And once that was asked, I realized that, that was pretty important context for someone to want to look at a community for the first time. And so that's a really great example of how questions within our company go to feedback into 8 Knot for everyone to use. Another good example is looking at, we were trying to figure out just the con contributors that were in PyTorch. And I remember whenever they came to me with the initial question, it was a very limited one of like, okay, how, who's the top commits or who's the ones opening the PRs. And as I started looking through the data, there was a much bigger story to be told. And it was actually the first time I realized how different the number of open commits and how many, ish, like not commits, open PRs and how many PRs are getting merged. This is, and I think that's a pretty common trend that you see in really like mature communities. So seeing whose PRs are getting merged and by who can really start to, you can really start to understand who are the major players within the communities, who is getting prioritized and who is producing the code that really goes into the code base. And so I'll kind of hop around. This one's not as visually pleasing because it's just a bunch of list of numbers and counts, but these reports have been something that has been vitally used within Red Hat and something that's developed in the last about six months but it does really build off of 8 Knot and Repel. A lot of these notebooks are where are in the research portion of it and they feed back up and it's a nice little feedback loop. So now we're gonna get to this top level. The thing that everyone wants to talk about is C-suite, even though this is probably the thing that I'm gonna talk about the least. And the big thing here is that we can do company and OSPO alignment with our corporate strategies. And this gives us the ability to provide qualitative, um, quantitative values to a hugely quantitative value proposition. A lot of times our C-suites do not understand what we do. And one of the best things that we can do is provide some context in the language that they're used to seeing, which is numbers. I would say a lot of the times the different members of OSPO when they're going to speak and talk in these rooms, they're not saying anything any different than they were before, but now they have numbers and metrics and visualizations to back their claims. And I do genuinely feel like the ears are a lot more open to what people are saying because they feel like that they have a value proposition behind them and context in it. And I feel like it leaves a lot more room for productive conversations instead of just having to go back and forth of really trying to push why does community matter. And for this one, 
How does this look in action? A lot of this is just looking at what reports and graphics align with the company goals. Um, a lot of it's going to be the visualizations and the reports that you've seen in the prior two steps. And that's kind of the concept behind this pyramid. Those should be the basis of what you're doing and should be feeding into the top. It's going to all be very case by case, but these data and graphs go into the presentations and we can meet and show that our priorities are lining up with what our leadership is wanting. So, what are my closing thoughts here? Um, when I started down the path of community data analysis, my central goal was to take something that would take a person 10, 20, 40 hours on their own to figure out and turn it into a 20 minute process with the vast majority of that time spent just processing that information that's in front of them. And really, this has not changed. If anything, it's been deeply validated and has only grown. I've gotten to see it in action and realize how much that these, this information can truly help the decision-making process within your company. Community is always the base and pivotal portion of your work, or of this work. It, is all about what you do at that level that feeds into the value above. If you don't have anything good to show, it's not going to be useful for your cross-organization collaboration or your C-suite advocacy. Our OSPO efforts and analysis need a balanced diet. Let's start fueling ourselves correctly. Thank you. Any questions? Isaac, yeah. Is there any plan for providers to maybe migrate some of the database queries and stuff to upstream auger? To upstream auger. Well, good thing we have Sean here. Most of the, a lot of the queries, we are turning them into materialized views. And so that's what a lot of these um, graphs actually, when their first iteration, were extremely slow. Um, and so once we got to a more finalized place with each one of the visualizations, that's whenever we would go and make a materialized view um, with our Augur database, which is a Postgres database. And so it makes it to where the data collection is much faster. And so we're able to provide these visualizations live. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, it's a goal. <laughs> Looking for engineering time. Contributions. Contributors, welcome. Sweet. There's nothing. Oh, yeah. I would say that's something I'm still figuring out. I would say, if you would have talked to me about three or four months ago, I was starting to think more about like a general like community analysis like health report and something that we could just like run off the bat. And I realized that in actuality, when somebody comes with me to a specific question, there's always a little bit of tweaking in context to whatever the question is, whatever the community is, to be able to provide the most useful analysis. And so that's why a lot of times I don't think that these visualizations and metrics are very useful to people who don't also have the community context. And so you need to know who you're talking to. And so if you're talking to someone who doesn't have a lot of community analysis, you need to make sure to pair them up with somebody that does. And then if you have somebody with a lot of community knowledge but doesn't really understand how to read graphs, then you need to make sure that you pair it up with somebody who is able to help interpret the graphs. So you have to have kind of those two sides. That's not like your direct question, but I'd say I've thought about it. I probably want to do some more analysis to see if some things start to come to the top, like those different graphs that I was showing right at the beginning of the community ones. That seems to be, those are like the four that I know I almost do in every single analysis reports, and then that's where the variability comes. And so I could see there it coming to be, okay, here's the set that I know I'm gonna use every time, and then this is where I start to tweak with the context of the community and the question being asked. 
Um, but I've also found that just with the internal request, the analysis breakdown that I put with any of the now, like the data that I give to them is what's the most valuable and what people actually look at. Because with the graphs alone, they really can't get much from it. Well, that's all I got, folks. Thanks, everybody.